Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining our winterization for homeowners 101 class. Um, we're going to delve into the essentials of preparing and protecting your home in the harshest winter conditions. Um, first of all, we want to thank GVEA and HFC for sponsoring our fall class series. Um, we will have a question and answer portion at the end of uh, the presentation, uh, but if you do have a question in the middle, you can raise your hand or enter it into the chat um, and we'll read it and uh, hopefully it'll get answered. So um, presenting today is our expert, Shelby Clem. Um, he is the Senior Manager of Planning and Construction at RollCap. Um, Shelby joins us from Anchorage and has 25 years of construction experience in Washington and Alaska. And he's worked for Rural Cap for almost 15 years. And um, during that time, he's dedicated most of his time to working with communities along the West Coast of Alaska. So thank you so much for joining us, Shelby. We are so excited to have you. All right, thank you, Rose. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, this is pretty exciting for me. It's something I've always wanted to do. And uh, yeah, so I finally got a chance at it. So um, yeah, so um, my hope here today is, um, well, when I started planning for this, I thought, you know, well, I'll just give out a bunch of, of good, you know, homeowner tips or, you know, from my experiences living in Alaska. And uh, as, the more I started to think about that, the more I thought about, well, um, how about just give everybody some basic building science knowledge um, and then some examples along the way um, of, of how to use these, the, you know, this knowledge to, 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 work, to work on your own house, right? So um, with that thought in mind, um, I, I would like to just get right to it. Um, this first slide is uh, just basically explaining stack pressure in a house. Stack pressure is what I use um, uh, that really drives my assessments, right? Um, air leakage in a house is is probably one of the biggest problems uh, that we that we have in housing. And um, but it's also one of the cheapest things that you can you know you can fix, uh, depending on where that leakage is. So, uh, staring at this first slide here, uh, we see what we call stack pressure, right? And when I say stack pressure, I mean uh, your house acts like a chimney, right? Uh, the taller, the more dramatic this effect is, but 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 the fact is it all happens in every dwelling, right? At the bottom where you see down here, we've got cold air uh, entering the house, infiltration, right? Uh, then we pay to warm that air up. And then the air rises as it gets more uh, buoyant and, and tries to escape through every hole we have in the top of our house, right? So knowing that this is negative down here and we're positive up here, uh, somewhere in the middle there is what we call the neutral pressure plane, right? And that is the magic line for me. Um, a little story to kind of paint the picture here, right? Um, one of my first seasons working out in one of the, the rural communities, um, we had an old man that when we came to his house to start our project, he um, he took off to go hunting that day, right? Well, when he got back in, he came in, took his boots off, and uh, was just about to put his slippers on. And he looked at me and he's like, "Wow, my floor is really warm. Um, I don't know what you guys did to my floor, but you know, it's I've, I've never felt it like this before." And you know, I looked at him and I was like, "Sir, we haven't even touched your floor." But what we did do was seal up so many holes in his attic that. Uh, the heat couldn't escape like it used to, right? So it builds up there. It builds and it builds and it pushes that neutral pressure plane down. So what was 75 degrees, six feet up on the wall is now 75 degrees, say four feet down on the wall. Um, that's the difference he was feeling, right? Um, so next slide, I can uh, show a, a more uh, better example, right? Uh, this is a building being built. I'm not sure where the city is. Um, but if you look at the bottom, you can see that this, the, the plastic is being sucked in tight to the building, right? That's infiltration. Up top, as we go up, we can kind of see that the, the, the plastic is being pushed out by the positive pressure. Um, again, somewhere in the middle there is that neutral pressure plane. 
Now, uh, one rule I like to keep, at least start with this rule, is you know infiltration uh, at the bottom. We try to seal that up at the outside, right? And then as we go up, we get exfiltration, and we try to seal that from the inside of the house. Um, just a simple rule I, I try to keep. Uh, next slide. All right, and now we have three types of heat loss. Um, radiation is, you know, a good example is the sun or a, our heated floor, right? Um, convection, boiling water, or, or baseboard heat. Uh, conduction is um, solar heat transferring, an example of solar heat transferring through walls, windows, or other exterior surfaces. Um, Sometimes evaporation is listed in this as a fourth type, but it won't. It's for what we're looking at today. Uh, these are the three main ones. Next slide. All right. So air leakage, right? This is uh, this is a house that I did in Nome a few years back. Um, this house has knee walls in it. I'm not sure if anybody knows what that is, but you know, it's a it's a four foot wall here dividing the, this small attic section from the room upstairs, right? And it has that on both sides of it. What you can see here in this picture is a perfect outline of that, that knee wall attic up there. Um, this is insulated, but it is, it is not air sealed at all, right? So any of our, our warm, moist air is creeping up inside here, and it's literally melting that snow in a perfect like x-ray of the attic below it. Um, we remedied this by pulling back the insulation, air sealing all penetrations, um, replacing the bats and we added an additional six inches of insulation on that so now what you see now is and, and this was like within you know 20 minutes of of, of work up here we now have a, a a uniform snow load on the on the um on the roof um that's one of the things as you know being a weatherization guy as we're driving through town my wife just it, it drives her insane that i'm always pointing out uneven snow loads on people's houses and you know, drive-by assessments. <laughs> so, uh, next slide. All right, air leakage examples and remedies. So these are some slides, some pictures I took in some of our houses along over the years. The first one there you see is an attic hatch. And it's, all that is, is warm, moist air escaping um, through the attic hatch and freezing right above the insulation line. Um, the easy fix to this is, is sealing the attic hatch or, or, or getting an attic, attic hatch that seals tight. Um, next over here, this is a common problem that we see um, all over Alaska, but uh, a lot of it in, in Western Alaska where we have smaller houses and a lot of overcrowding issues uh, and lack of ventilation. So this is all frost um, on the top of the roof, on the bottom of the roof deck. Um, it's one of the questions that I get you know, or have when I'm doing assessments all the time is, does your roof leak? And if it's a yes, then I ask when. And if it's not, you know, when it's raining, then I'm, you know, you can pretty much diagnose the problem. We have a lot of frost up here. As soon as that sun hits the right angle each year or uh, warms up, it starts to rain. And uh, people think that their roof's leaking, but really um, this, is, uh, this is a ventilation issue. The bottom, uh, slide here with the door threshold is something I see an awful lot. Um, and it's easily fixed. A lot of people don't realize that on the bottom of your door, there's four, uh, four little plastic caps, right? And if you pop those off, you'll see there's a screw down inside there that adjusts that threshold to bring it up to meet the bottom of the door again. Um, depending on where you're at in this state, uh, that little gap can be a huge, huge deal. Um, we, I've seen, you know, Arctic entryways, um, you know, living rooms filled with snow, um, from just that little crack, you know, when it's blowing 50, 60 miles an hour outside, the snow starts drifting, uh, it gets really fine, like sand, and it'll work its way in anywhere. Um, another place that we see a lot of that happening is in attic vents, gable vents, especially, um, I, I've seen attics filled with snow, I've had to shovel out attics before, um, before I could insulate them. Uh, next slide. All right, now this is a common one uh, everywhere in Alaska. A lot of people think that they need more insulation for ice dams. 
Um, and, and that could be the case, but um, what's really happening there is air leakage. Um, air is warm air is rising on to that roof deck, melting the snow on top of it, and then it runs down like a glacier uh, until it hits someplace that's not heated, which is the eaves of your roof. Then we freeze and it starts to accumulate. And as it starts to accumulate, it starts to work itself up under your shingles and under the underlayment and do real damage to your roof. Um, the answer here is air sealing. All right, some more examples of uh, ice damming. Uh, the picture you see of the house there, that is actually my house. Um, this is a picture I took last winter. Um, I've done extensive air sealing up in this little attic above my bathroom. Um, I we haven't got any snow yet, so I have yet to see if I've I've got this fixed. But what you know, you can see a clear X-ray of that room above the bathroom there. Um, sealed over here, sealed over here. Um, massive air leaks. It, what, what it was is is a very poorly done vapor barrier. Uh, there was plastic up there, but it was just stapled, not sealed. And uh, so what I've done now is I've taken rigid insulation, uh, used it as a vapor barrier plus insulation, um, put it up in the roof and and uh, sealed the edges up. So fingers crossed, um, I've got this issue fixed. Next slide. All right. So air sealing a house. Um, without ventilation is, is is dangerous frankly um you can really mold really starts to build up when we when we uh have air sealing with no ventilation in the house now i work normally in in the western alaska in the rural communities and like i said we have uh, a lot of smaller houses but you know overcrowding issues right um i'll never forget i went into a house one time um and when I looked at the assessment form, I thought, no way 22 people live in this house. And when I walked in, it was probably more than that. You know, it was everybody was, you know, mattresses everywhere. And, and what I really picked up on was the fact that there's so much moisture in this house that the air can't hold it anymore. And it, it was raining in our in the house. Um, not only was it raining, but the mold was making a, a perfect X-ray on every building member behind the drywall. And when I say that, I mean, you can look at the ceiling and see every single truss above it by a black line on the ceiling. Um, every truss clip that it was held to the wall with, the little diamond clips, you could see a perfect diamond every two feet across the exterior walls. Um, and of course, windows like that, you know, moisture on all the windows. Um, ventilation is the cure, is the, cured to all of this, right? It, um, you can't have an air sealed house and not have ventilation. The indoor air quality drops. Um, and then, yeah, warm, moist air condenses on cold surfaces such as windows, um, you know, wood behind the walls. Um, but that's important to know that warm, moist air condenses on cold surfaces and soon after we'll make mold. Next slide. Here's a few more of them here. So I was in a house in uh, one of our, I can't remember the community right now, but it was during a, an inspection trip I had. And when we walked into the house, tiny house, about 10 people in there, but she was hanging laundry, uh, which is commonplace um, in, in rural Alaska. But when we walked in, the, the windows looked worse than this, right? Uh, it was really, really iced up. And uh, my manager was with me at the time and he, he, this was the perfect example to prove ventilation to that client, right? So we went and we turned up the bath fan that we installed in the house. We turned up the CFM on it. And then we also had a hygrometer uh, with us that we, we set on that window sill, right? And I remember it vividly when we, when we turned it on, it was like at 86, 87% humidity in the house. And when the fan turned on, it, it just started to click down, right? And as it started to click down one, one point at a time, you could look at the window as well and see that the window was de-icing. And by the time we left that house, um, it was, you know, there was no more ice or moisture left on the window. So 
Um, I like to let everybody know that because there's a there's a lot of uh, window companies in particular that would lead you to believe that this is a faulty window, when in fact it is not. Um, we can put the best window that they make in your house. It will never be as warm as the wall next to it, right? So it's always going to be the colder surface in the house where any kind of moisture is going to find uh, condense and, and, and eventually make mold. Um, up here, you can see an example of uh, what I was saying, where mold will almost make an x-ray, right? Now, this particular picture here isn't um, a, a truss, right? Um, this is just between the trusses. And so it's pretty easy to see here that we're, we're probably missing a bat of insulation right there and all the way down this uh, or either that or the eave uh, venting behind it is, is letting cold air blow in there and making this colder than, uh, than the truss next to it, right? Um, so next slide. Ventilation solutions. Now, whenever we're doing a weatherization project in a house, is we, we at least have to stall, install an exhaust-only bath fan uh, with a smart switch on it, right? And um, the, the bath fans that we use don't use a whole lot of power. Um, they're, they're, they're called Whisper Green fans. They, they use a lot less, lot, lot less power than any other, and you don't hear them. To so much so that I get complaints constantly from people that their fan doesn't work and I go to their house and it is indeed working, but it's totally silent. In the switch here, though, is where the magic happens. Now, this is uh, based on ASHRAE calculations, uh, building size, occupancy. Um, I can't remember what the other one is, but we set this fan to a certain setting, right, to where it'll automatically ventilate that house and keep good indoor air quality. Um, down here, this is more expensive, but it is a way better unit, right? These fans, it's important to know that this is exhaust only, right? So you're paying to, you know, to heat your house and, and this just pumps it out, right? But you do air, you do have air changes per hour uh, based on the fact that, you know, no house is super, super tight and it's bringing in fresh air as it's pushing it out. But the thing is, it's also bringing that air through, uh, you know, how many cracks and crevices in the house and probably bringing some contaminants with it. So um, while it works, it's probably not the best thing to do. If we can afford to do an HRV or ERV, uh, heat recovery ventilators or e energy recovering ventilators, um, this is way a, a way better product, right? But it is uh, it is harder to install and, and um, yeah, and, and probably a little bit more expensive to run. But you're not pumping all your hot air out of your house this way. Uh, next slide. This is a picture I took of one of our houses here on a really frosty day. And uh, this is actually an example of successful ventilation, right? This is a lot of, of warm, moist air turning into ice and frost on the outside of the house. But keep in mind, without that fan, this would all be on the inside of the house where it creates mold and, and, and bad indoor air quality. Um, Next slide. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors. This is uh, probably one of the biggest things that um, we do to a house. Um, after air sealing a uh, house, uh, you know, depending on how tight we've gotten that house, the chances of backdraft increase immensely. And when I say backdraft, I mean, you know, if you've got any fans or anything that exhausts to the outside is, is going to get its air from somewhere, right? And when it does, you know, if the rest of the house is sealed, well, usually if you have a natural drafting appliance, heating appliance in your house, um, it's probably the next easiest place for it to bring air into, you know, into the house, but it's bringing carbon monoxide with it. Um, I know that over my 15 years uh, doing this, I've saved several lives uh, with these carbon monoxide detectors. Um, we put these ones in here because they will read low levels of carbon monoxide. Um, people, um, you know, the, uh, every carbon monoxide alarm goes off at 78 parts per million. Um, but CO can accumulate in your body and, 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 and poison you before this alarm even goes off, if it ever goes off. So we like people to know the, the carbon monoxide level in their house at all times. Um, quick story about this, uh, carbon or about carbon monoxide in general, um, 
I had a client that we, um, we weatherized this house, did a really good job on it. It was really tight and the ventilation worked and everything. And it was just exactly how I'd want that house, right? But then after we finished the project, for whatever reason, uh, the old man couldn't pay his electrical bill. So he got shut off. So when I went to go get the final sign off for him that day, the first thing I do when I walk in the house is check this, especially if it's been a little while since we've been in there. And uh, it was like 300 parts per million. Um, and when I went and checked it, he looked at me and he was like, yeah, man, that dang thing keeps beeping all the time. I think it's broke. And I was like, no, no, no. And I look over and he's cooking his coffee and heating his house with this Coleman camp stove um, in a little 200 square foot house, you know. And so we stopped, you know, stopped to talk about carbon monoxide poisoning right there. And um, and I think I got through to him, you know what I mean? He, he, he didn't cook with his Coleman camp stove anymore. So um, next slide. Oh, I got a, a great little video to show you guys. Um, this kind of explains everything um, that I just kind of went over, but uh, in a little easier way, maybe. Go ahead. I can't hear Yeah, Rosa, unfortunately, so standby technical difficulties. Sometimes for videos, they can be a little bit tricky. Right. Sorry, Presentation. Sorry, no, it's okay. Um, try, try one more time. It might just not, we just might not be able to hear it. Is it not showing up for you now at all? Hold on. Um, a tale of weatherization. Oh, no. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's okay. We've got time. <laughs> yeah, the, it's not letting me play it from here. Here we go. Can you hear it? A tale of weatherization. Yep. This is the story of Grandma's house. Grandma's house works. It isn't a fancy house, and it may not be a comfortable house for Grandma. But as far as building science goes, it works. At Grandma's house, the dry outside air is constantly moving through it, keeping moisture and odors from building up inside. And Grandma keeps a pot of water on the stove just to keep the humidity level up. And Grandma lives many years content in her little house without any problems. But Grandma is getting old. And she is getting tired of hauling all that wood. And right as she is thinking about how a change may be needed, Red comes to visit her Grandma. And as all youngins do, she knows exactly what Grandma needs. Grandma needs insulation. Red makes her case, shows her the brochure, and Grandma calls Big Mike. Big Mike does exactly as he is asked and insulates the attic so Grandma can save money and use less wood. And Grandma is very happy. Until Grandma notices a water stain on the ceiling. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Dear, Grandma can't catch a break. Now the roof's leaking. So Grandma calls Big Mike. And Big Mike sees the problem right away. When he added the insulation, now the roof is cooler because the heat is staying in the house. But the bad news is the moisture from inside the house now condenses and freezes on the underside of the roof when it didn't used to. But no worries. Big Mike knows exactly what to do. This house just needs to be air sealed to stop the house moisture from getting up to the attic. Then all grandma's problems will be solved. If only he thought of that earlier. 
Now he has to remove all that insulation he just put in, air seal the attic, and replace the insulation. But Grandma's problems aren't solved. One day, Grandma notices something strange. Grandma couldn't see when Red was coming to visit anymore. Her windows had too much condensation. And now the grandma's house is so humid, there are little spots on her wall. At first, she didn't notice. But before long, those little spots have turned into big spots all over her walls. And by now, she is calling Big Mike, demanding, what have you done? Well... Big Mike realizes the mold is growing because the walls are wet from condensation. No problem. We'll warm up the walls by putting in some insulation. And the excess moisture? Now that Grandma's house has been air sealed and insulated, she doesn't need that pot. But to be extra safe, Big Mike has one more idea for Grandma. We'll add some ventilation to Grandma's house. And Grandma just to be safe, runs that fan a lot. But poor grandma, she notices when she runs the fan, something is wrong with her stove. And grandma learns very quickly, the big fan always wins. So once again, grandma calls Big Mike. And once again, Big Mike came back. Big Mike realized the error of his ways. With all the insulating and air sealing, we were saving Grandma a lot on her energy costs. But in addition to the condensation and mold, now her stove is backdrafting. With that big fan running, the stove doesn't draft properly. There's just not enough air. So Big Mike installs an outside air feed directly to the stove and installs makeup air for the exhaust fan. Grandma and Red lived happily ever after. And Big Mike? He realized the house has to work as a system, got the necessary training, and repainted the van. The End All right. Well, that was a video that they showed us in my first building science class, and it really helped things gel for me. Um, and, and I hope it did for you, too. Um, that being said, um, that's the end of my slideshow. Sorry, I kind of powered through those awful quickly. Uh, but I'm hoping people have a lot of questions that I can answer for you. So um, or at least try to. So fire away if you got them. Hi, this is Elena. I can't start my video. It says the host has stopped it, so sorry. You just hear my voice. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm thinking specifically of my house. There's an area where it's kind of like a bay-shaped area, and it gets ice damming above it. Um, it has uh, doors to the outside. And I was told um, just insulated really well, but it sounds like what I need is both uh, weatherization and insulation. Yeah, uh, air sealing primarily, it, it, you know, would would help that a lot. And um, I, I didn't actually hit it in the in the slideshow, but uh, the blower door. I don't know if you, if anybody's familiar with the blower door, but um, that's the tool we use to really really target air leakage. And um, and and so I would suggest that everybody, if you haven't had one done, um, have a blower done or an energy rating done in your house. Um, it'll really pinpoint where you need to, to do work at in the house. But the bay windows, that, that's, uh, you know, that's, that, they're always a problem. Um, I see right. more moldy ceilings on bay windows. Uh, just because for one, you can't really, a lot of them, you can't get the, the same level of insulation as the rest of the roof, you know what I mean? So you have different insulation levels. So one surface is colder than the other. And, uh, yeah, the, that, you know, yeah. Thanks. I have a question. Yeah. 
Um, what are some of the most common of the of the different things you've discussed? What is the most common and what do you think is the most urgent? Um, mold, um, you know, where, where I where I generally work at um, a, a lot of mold in houses, indoor air quality, um, ventilation, you know, everybody wants their house weatherized and, and, and you know, and it is, is everybody wants, you know, is, is on board with the air sealing and then the um, insulation on top of that. But then every, every, almost every time we go to put a fan in a house, somebody is really skeptical of it because, you know, where I work at, you know, heating fuel can be anywhere from six to eight, you know, sometimes $10 a gallon, right? So that's a really expensive way to heat your house. So uh, when I come in and I tell somebody that I'm going to save them all this, and then the last thing I do is put in a fan that blows out um people are really skeptical to, to the point where i've had people standing there with saran wrap and you know are waiting for me to get my picture for my files and then we're going to cover this bad boy up you know and it's it's just it's detrimental to the house you know um for one the, the occupants you know um you're you're breathing stale air and and everybody's air right it's not being changed out and um so you know for an example when somebody's sick in a house like that it just keeps going around and around and around that house because there's no ventilation uh in the house and so it just morphs into like a, a worse you know sickness um yeah i would say ventilation lack of ventilation is is um the leading cause to a lot of problems in houses that i see I have a question kind of following that. Uh, you, you mentioned the HRVs and um, and th those are pretty useful. Does every house need one or is it, you know, big houses with not as many people living in them? Is it is it less of an issue? And can like a standalone air filter, air purifier kind of just help supplement that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't. Right. But with the HRVs, they come in all different, different models. Right. Um, it's it depending on what your house, how it's set up, it could be a, a kind of a tough retrofit. Um, if you don't have an attic or something like that, where you can run ducting. Um, but no, they come in all shapes and sizes. And uh, when I'm doing a, a, what they call a, an ASHRAE report, right. For our files, um, the only thing it won't let me do is put an occupancy of one because it won't read it won't register right so i have to have at least two people and that being said it you know it, it's dictating that it's no matter how many people live in the house uh ventilation is important um probably not as if you have one person in a house two people and depending on the size of the house you know it's not you're not going to mold your house down with just you breathing in it right but um I would say the, the the need for it is still there. Um, it's just, you know, they're on automatic settings too. So it's not like it's be running all the time. Um, and you can set it to whatever, um, you know, you want it to. We usually default to, um, you know, 10 minutes an hour, at least in, in, in every house. Does that answer that for you, Will? Yeah, yeah, it did. I, I also was thinking kind of about humidity in the house. Is there an ideal humidity level that we should be shooting for? Definitely. Yeah. So that smart switch I showed on the wall earlier, um, we usually, you know, inside there's a little dial that we set up for, for uh, humidity. And, and I'll usually keep it between 40 and 50. Uh, you know, too dry is a problem, too. Um, I know I used to live in like a log cabin out in Palmer with a wood stove and um, sometimes our humidity in that house would be like 11%, right. And, and, you know, wake up with nosebleeds and just itchy skin all the time. And, um, so yeah, there is a happy medium between too dry and too wet, um, about 40, between 40 and 50%. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So if you're a beginning homeowner and this is your first winter um, living in your new home, what should you be looking out for? Um, ice damming, for one. That's a clear sign of air leakage. Like I was saying, I drive around town. I look at uniform snow loads on roofs. You know what I mean? If I can see, you know, um, gaps or whatever, I know um, there's air loss there, heat loss. 
Um, what else? Um, the icing on the windows is a big one. Um, but that's all ventilation, like I was saying. Um, one big one uh, that a lot of people are confused on, and I think I have this right. I don't want to confuse anybody anymore, but um, I don't have a crawl space in my house, right? But I know if you do, there's venting in the crawl space. And it, it, it's my understanding that you want to plug those up in the wintertime and, and make sure you open them in the summertime. So it can ventilate. But I've seen many, many, many of frozen pipes in people's houses from having the crawl space vents open, right? And so knowing what we just talked about with the, the building science and stack pressure, right? When you have those vents opened up in the wintertime, uh, your house is going to be, you know, pulling that cold air in, in the crawl space, right? And a lot of times it'll pull that cold air right past a, a, a plumbing pipe. And it doesn't take long at, you know, 20, 30 below of that air blowing across it before that pipe freezes right there and breaks. So that's another common one is, is frozen pipes. And, um, you know, depending on what, that just depends on what your, you know, your house you live in. Um, like you said, mobile homes, we, we find a lot of those um, frozen pipes in mobile homes. And uh, the, 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 the solution we found is insulated skirting uh, around those mobile home, bot the bellies of them. Uh, that tends to, to uh, for one, make a warmer floor for somebody. And for two, it kind of keeps that, that temperature regulated down there. Um, would the insulated skirting also work for cabins that are up, like up on, like post on pad cabins? Yeah, definitely, Justin. Um, and not and and not only for that, this just brings me to a whole new uh, like a tangent, right? Um, any of the, our houses all in Western Alaska are, are like you said, up on post and uh, post and beams, right? So we are having, and I'm sure it's happening here, but more dramatic on the West Coast. Uh, global warming is really, really taking a toll out there. And when I was working in the the village of Guinahawk. Um, you could see in our neighborhood that where the sun rose, it was, you know, wherever it hit underneath that house, the, the, the soil was two feet lower than it would be back behind the house where the sun never hit, right? And so um, we're losing permafrost, right? And so your house starts to settle and, 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 and you know, um, yeah, it, it just settles, right? And so insulated skirting helps with that too. Um, you, you help keep the ground a little bit more solid underneath of you. Um, yeah, well, I was in uh, one place, Kipnuk, a few years ago, um, where you can see all the new housing houses were built uh, five feet off the ground when they were built, right? Now, every one of those houses has a three-foot rust line underneath of it where the, the ground has sunk three feet. And now you've got like eight feet underneath the house. Um, so, yeah, uh, insulated skirting, number of good uses for it. Um, yeah, that being one of them. Great, thanks. Yep. I have a question about air leakage through the floor and um, sealing the floor in a cabin that's on post and beams. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it and how can it be done? Um, we, use, uh, we use rigid foam a lot. And then uh, spray foam the edges and the perimeters, uh, just making sure that it's, you know, every place there's a seam edge or a perimeter um, that it's sealed up. Um, and it's, 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 it's very important, right? So when we talk about stack pressure, right? Your house is, is calling for that air and it is, you know, it's gonna pull that cold air up through any gap or, you know, crack you have in that floor. And then, uh, you know, interesting enough, I had one of my managers a long time ago uh, read a study that um, based on, you know, if, if, if there's um, cold air infiltrates from the bottom, right? So if we had sealed a hundred percent sealed up the walls and the ceiling of a house, would the floor even still leak? And scientifically I'd say no. Right. But that's in a lab. Right. But now you add a driving force to that of wind or whatever, um, you kind of take that out of the equation. So I would always say seal the floor. As a matter of fact, that's where I start at on houses. 
um, keep that cold air from infiltrating. And like I said, the, the easiest way um, is, is when it's infiltrating, seal it from the outside. If it's exfiltrating, seal it from the inside. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any special recommendations for houses that have basements or crawl spaces below the ground and, and ceiling like that? Is it all the same or do you kind of take a different approach? No, we we take a definitely different approach, like a slab on is what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done this two ways. Uh, one house we had in Unilicleet, um, I, I dug an eight foot down all the way around the house, right? And was able to add a vapor, uh, a bituthane uh, membrane and, uh, and, and two inch styrene. And, and that person loved it, right? They had all their, 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 their food stored down there and everything. And he had a real bad problem of it freezing um, every year. But then he was the first one to come to me after we did that. And uh, he said, it, it's amazing. You know what I mean? It's, it's not only not freezing down there, it's, it's like, you know, 68, 70 degrees now. Uh, we, we can actually hang out down there, right? And I was so glad to hear that because we put a ton of work into that to make that happen. Uh, but that's one way to do it. Um, here in Anchorage, you know, we do a lot of, you know, peeling off uh, or paneling or whatever, and we'll, we'll styrene the wall on the inside and recover it. Um, yeah, that's, you know, styrene on those block walls is, is, is big, um, whether it be on the inside or the outside. Um, yeah, it, it, it really makes a difference. Um, for ventilating smaller homes and you don't necessarily have the money to put an HRV or something in, would you recommend multiple fans? Like, like say if the bathroom's like off in a corner and not really right, like right. near the whole um, home. You'd be amazed, Justin. I mean, like we, 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 you know, we use one, you know, even if a house has two bath fans in it, like say here in Anchorage, uh, we'll usually just put a smart switch on one of those. And, uh, you know, these fans are getting up to, you can adjust them for 50 to 80 to 110 CFM. So uh, depending on the size of your house, you know, 80 CFM is going to act as a whole house ventilator. Uh, and that's that, that one slide I showed you with the frost on the outside of it. That's, that's only coming from a, from a bath fan. Wow. That is impressive. Yeah. Uh, they're well worth it. I don't want to be like a Panasonic rep here, but. You know, I think they're like we pay 150 bucks for a fan, maybe, and uh, and and they work. Um, but like I said, if you can go, you can spend thousands on this with HRVs or whatever. But uh, if you're just trying to keep it simple, um, that's what I would do. And and in addition to that, also, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what a fresh 80 is, but it's like a little plastic pop open vent. Um, Normally, I like to add at least one of those with the Panasonic to give it a, a cleaner pathway for the for the intake air. You know what I mean, as opposed to pulling it through all the cracks, cracks and crevices of our house and um, bringing all those pollutants with it. So, um, I try to give the air the air coming in a cleaner pathway. Now, and now placement of that fresh eighty is important as well. Um, you know what I mean? It's it's when that fan comes on, it's going to pull some cold air through there. So. Um, one of the places I like to put that fresh 80, if you can, on an exterior wall uh, behind the refrigerator, right? Because it, 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 it helps the refrigerator stay cool and you don't feel that breeze coming across you anywhere in the house. Would there, be any, would, would there be any issue running something like that through an attic and pulling air through the attic? Um, yes, because you're pulling fiber, depending on what your insulation is up there, you'd be pulling particles of that as well. We get a lot of those where, 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 you know, combustion air for the furnace or whatever, we'll notice when we do the assessment that while it looks like it's good, you know, eggs, you know, terminating outside of the house, you go up in the attic and you see that's where it's pulling it from. And, uh, for one, you know, it, it goes against the whole envelope, um, theory of a house, you know what I mean? You want to get that, that air, or pull that air from outside the envelope and exhaust outside that envelope, so.
Did I cut somebody off? I thought somebody was going to ask another question. We had two people at once. Oh, uh, no, that was just me thanking you. Oh, okay. Sorry, just Yep. Thank you. I'm going to take a moment to interrupt really quick and mm -hmm. launch another poll. We all love polls, but just before I lose more of you, um, there's an exit poll that if you would all take some time before you pop off and, and continue to ask your questions, we'd really appreciate it. So you should see that pop up in a second. And um, are there any last questions? No questions, but this has been helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, and thank you so much, Shelby, for sharing your expertise. Um, this was some really valuable information and thank you so much for presenting. Um, we want to thank again, um, GVEA and AHFC for sponsoring our class series. Um, and I want to thank Carrie from Information Insights for helping us run the class. Um, we just want to let everyone know that we have two more classes in our fall class series coming up um, the next week at the same time 5 30 on tuesday um, october 24th is heat pump for heat pumps for homeowners that's going to be taught by our very own tom marsick um, who is a heat pump specialist um, he works for cchrc and um, alaska center for energy and power um, it's a great chance to explore uh, energy efficient heating alternative solutions. Um, and then on November 7th, also at 5.30, um, we will have our Healthy Alaskan Homes class where we'll be covering uh, more about mold, lead, and asbestos and how to avoid those health um, dangers. So thank you everyone for joining and for doing the poll. And we hope to see you at our next classes. It looks like we have one last question that's like oh, in please. the chat from, from Nancy. Um, cell, cellulose insulation, what else can we use other than this? Cellulose is messy. Yeah, cellulose is, uh, yeah. when we go to blow a cellulose attic, it's just like we're, we're doing rock, paper, scissors, see who's going to do it right because it's dirty, it's nasty. Um, I like using fiberglass. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are hesitant um, because of the particulates and, and can be irritating or whatever. But again, if you have a sealed attic, you know what I mean, which you, you know, you can verify with a blower door. Um, I, I like fiberglass all day long. Uh, it's for one, we use it out in rural. Um, it's, it, it, it's, you know, if it gets wet, it can be, you know, it's not a total loss. You know, fiberglass insulation can dry out and it still retains a lot of its R value. Um, whereas cellulose, you know, if it gets wet, it's, it's pretty much done. Um, so we like fiberglass, um, that being said, I've also seen a lot of attics and, 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 um, you know, uh, crawl spaces with rigid foam. Uh, it's a lot, you know, it's a little bit more expensive, but, uh, it's easier to put on. Um, and it, you get a pretty good R value with a minimal, um, you know, uh, space. Uh, wool. Um, I have not worked with wool too much. I've heard a lot about it. Um, you know, um, for us with my weatherization program, um, everything has to have a savings to investment ratio and rock wool is a little, is, is kind of spendy. And, uh, so, and, and also I'm not exactly sure how it would, um, hold up to water or moisture, um, which is, you know, the over, there's the, the environment is just moist out there. Um, but by all means, I've, I've heard a lot about rock wool, uh, especially lately. Um, I know it's more natural. Um, and so, um, I, I'm not familiar with it too much to, to speak on it. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again, Shelby. That was a really great presentation. Thank you.